Okay, well, thank you. I am thrilled to be here. This is a, a lot of fun. And uh, so, uh, hello, Indicate, Indicate East. Because it's very confusing, right? We have Indicate and then Indicate East. Are we calling Indicate West? West? <laughs> Indicate and then the spin off. What if we make, sorry? Indicate Prime. Indicate Prime. With two. two with a two-day delivery, uh, and then what if we make something in, like, between the two coasts? Would that be indicate Middle East? That would be confusing, right? <laughs> anyway, if we ever do indicate South, I, I call dibs for Uruguay because that's where I'm from. So, uh, if you never heard of Uruguay, Homer here is happy to uh, introduce the country to you uh, because you, you you have the South, the deep South and then the deep, 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 deep south, which is Uruguay. And um, it's kind of far away. I kind of flew 7,000 miles, no kidding, to be here. Uh, it was 90 degrees when I left. But uh, your warmth is uh, way better. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be uh, telling you a little, just starting with, uh, with something on Uruguay and, and me, but I'm actually going to talk about learning games. Boring, well, you'll see. But uh, Uruguay is, is very far away. If you, have you heard of a galaxy far, far away? Or if you keep going further, you get to Uruguay. And this is our, our flag. It's a small country. We only have uh, one star. That's on, the only thing we could afford. If you have any, <laughs> any states to spare, we'll be happy. We, we, we'll be happy to like, take Mex Mexico back, I mean, if you want. But uh, not Texas. You can keep Texas. Uh, nah, just kidding. Uh, if I ever become president, this is going to be the new flag. <laughs> but everybody knows each other where I'm from. So they know me, so there's no chances they're going to vote for me. Anyway, so uh, because uh, we're into video games, uh, I know a lot of people like to talk about the first car or first love. We're on Valentine's weekend. Uh, this was not my first computer. Uh, my first computer was a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. And, uh, but I'm not going to go like all uh, retro on computers. Actually, I'm going to tell, and I'm, I'm not kidding, for the very first time about my, fir my very first video game gig, which it's been 30 years since that. So a lot of the crimes, uh, I, I hope, cannot be prosecuted. And I'm actually not kidding. I never told this story in public before. Uh, I, I was a kid. I was not involved in the crimes. But, uh, but actually, this is sort of a true story. It's been broadcasted over the internet, right? So uh, I was on medication when I was a kid, so whatever I say just might not be. Anyway, <laughs> this is the thing. When I was 12 years old, I went to the dentist, very small country, and my dentist goes, uh, hey, Gonzalo, you're into computers, right? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, I said, well, you have to talk to, well, let's call him Mr. X. I don't know him. Uh, your parents know him. So. Um, I, uh, I told my parents, and actually Mr. X was a neighbor who lived a couple blocks away, and he was a smuggler. Like, he smuggled electronics into the country. This is hearsay. I mean, I never had any proof <laughs> of what happened. And uh, to make a long story short, the Adam Coleco vision, we call it Coleco, because that's a Spanish way, way to, to call it, which is, stands for Connecticut Leather Company. I mean, but they got into computers. And... Um, they, were, they had a bunch of broken computers, and again, hearsay. There was some problem, and some warehouses got on fire. And have you ever heard the, exp the expression, ship this to Uruguay? No. That's why people ship stuff to Uruguay. <laughs> so a lot of broken computers were shipped into Uruguay, and, uh, and there was this Mr. X guy who was, an, again, an, an ex-con, and he's a very interesting guy. But he, he was sweet to me. I mean, he was very, very, very nice. And he got all these computers, and they put them back together and sold them in Uruguay. And uh, so I showed up, and they actually hired me to have the weirdest. I don't know if anybody ever had this job before. Because they only had the spare parts, and they had a box with games. But they didn't have any instruction booklets, any, any titles, anything. So my job, again, I was 12 was to play these games, come up with a backstory, write down the instructions. <laughs> and these were heavily pixelated games. So I did my best and just put a little bit of fiction and a little bit. And uh, I got paid with hardware. 
I mean, which was ex outrageously expensive by then. We're talking about the mid '80s, and uh, uh, one day they called me and said, "We have a new a new thing that uh, we just received. It's called a modem. What is that? We don't know." Well, so I, I got my bag, got there, and said, "Well, you plug the computer uh, on the telephone. What for? We don't know." Uh, well, maybe you can like write, type down stuff, and uh, you can see it on the other monitor. Okay, that makes sense. And and then I said, I mean, no kidding. I said, this piece of beep will never be of any use, <laughs> never. So actually, I didn't get a modem. They said you can keep that anyway. <laughs> so uh, uh, I wrote these instruction manuals, and uh, and actually, Mr. X, who probably was not a very well-read man, but he read uh, the printout. And he really enjoyed it. And it was the first time I was kind of proud of getting an adult, like, happy about something I did. And uh, he said, wow, we're going to print, like, thousands of this. You should, you should have your name on the cover. So I was 12, very geeky, but smart enough not to have my name printed <laughs> anywhere near these people. So, uh, so I said, well, you know, Anonymous has a better flair to it, so let's go Anonymous. And I, I, I'm pretty sure he understood. I mean. Uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, that was my first job. And many years later, I went to college and I, I wrote my first dissertation. I, I decided to, to research video games, which was very weird at the time. I mean, I, couldn't, I could not find uh, anybody to supervise me because they were ashamed. Seriously, some of, um, one of them said, my colleagues are going to make fun of me. If, uh. So I got an economist who signed up the paperwork uh, for my dissertation. And so I went to the National Library, and under video games, the only thing that was filed was the instruction manuals I published when I was 12. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a true story. So I told the librarian, OK, I need to write a dissertation on this. Uh, what do you want to write, write about? Well, I don't know, narrative in games sort of made, game, made sense at the time. I said, well. Is there any discipline that studies this? Yes, we have this thing called narratology. OK, bring me all the books on narratology. And that's how I started. And then several years later, I wrote a little paper saying, well, this narratology thing doesn't really work. We need something I called ludology. And uh, OK, my life got a bit more complicated. But <laughs> all thanks to the Adam Kolekovician. So uh, that's how I got here, in addition to getting a lot of planes and flights. But uh, let's start with a proper talk. Uruguay is a 3.5 million people country, and uh, we like to do social experiments uh, since forever. We were the first country in South America to give women the right to vote. Uh, we recently passed, uh, passed a gay marriage, uh, gay adoption. 90% uh, of our electricity comes from renewable <laughs> resources. And what else we have? We, 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 oh, and drugs are free, and the state is going to sell marijuana starting this year. It's the first state that actually is going to produce and sell marijuana, which is <laughs> crazy. But the best so far, I mean, experiment has been the, the one lot per child. You probably heard about it. But Uruguay is the only country that fully committed to it. And every single boy and girl in the country gets a free computer bought by the government that they can keep with them, they can take home. And 75% of every boy and girl has free Wi-Fi within three blocks from their houses. And all the schools are connected. And uh, so we're sort of becoming the Brooklyn of uh, the world. <laughs> uh, and as you know, it's not uh, all rosy in Brooklyn. And uh, this has been great. I mean, the government has focused a lot on the digital divide and, and like, in terms of economics. But actually, it's been great for, uh, for girls. Because girls now have their own computer, and, 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 and like their, their brothers cannot boss them around and make fun of them and, and, and say, oh, you're playing it wrong. So they can do whatever they want. And that's, uh, that's pretty amazing. So we're going to have a big generation of very strong uh, women in technology. So watch out, gamer gates, thirst, and uh, they're coming from Uruguay. And uh, so the bad news is that uh, our educational system is not in good shape. Yes, we have computers that helps. That's great. Uh, I can see this every day. I, I teach in uh, the university also. I, I volunteer in a high school, and kids really get a lot of opportunities out of this. But just like every, pretty much every world, uh, everywhere in the world, the educational system is broken. And you know, I'm sure uh, you heard about this. So how do we fix 
this. There's no silver bullet solution. Let's ask a different question. How do we prepare children for a future that's going to be really, really different by the time they graduate? Because if you think about it, for the last couple thousand years, I mean, pretty much all the jobs you could get were like farmers or housewives. Later, you could, you could become uh, maybe a factory worker. But recently, I mean, there's a ton of, 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 of new jobs. So how do you prepare kids for that? Well, actually, it's not a, it sounds like a tough question, but it has a very easy solution, and it's been solved already by nature. If you think, how did we humans took over, for better or for worse, and control this planet, how were we prepared to deal with an ever-changing, ever-challenging world with different climates, different monsters and stuff? It's a very elegant solution. Evolution, simply, well, got wired two parts of our brains. The one with curiosity and pleasure. And we get a kick out of learning new stuff. Every time we find something new, we give it a try, we explore it, we break it, we put it in our mouths when we were babies, and, and we figure out the world that way. And that's another way of saying that we're playing with the world. So play, and I'm actually saying play, I'm not saying games. I mean, play is one of the ways we evolved to get prepared and adapt to uh, an ever-changing world. And there's a lot of hype about video games changing the school system and being a miracle solution for everything. And I'm, I, actually, my talk is going to be that, well, not so much. But I think there's some stuff that we can do. Because we have a lot of kids stuck in a system that was designed for a different world. And uh, I found this online. I don't know who said it, but uh, I just put it on, on meme form. And, uh, which is kind of actually true, I think. So what, what can we do uh, in education? There's a long tradition of educational uh, software and games. And uh, I have a PhD, so I can use a technical uh, term. 99% is pure crap. Uh, and of course, there are some interesting things happening. But I think, what can we, as designers, provide, put on the table and collaborate. And I think we have one little thing that we're used to that a lot of people in the educational world, even a lot of passionate teachers, are not fully uh, acquainted with, which is we know that frustration is OK. We understand that in order to progress, I have a friend who says, life is like a video game. If, you're, if you take a path and there's plenty of enemies coming your way, you know you're on the right path. Uh, so uh, the education system was, was built for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And actually, it's very like, overprotective of children. And basically, what it does is that, oh, you're just a boy or a girl. You're not prepared for the real world. So we're going to groom you, and then later we'll let you out. They're telling this to kids who have more viewers in YouTube than all the poets of the world together, right? Uh, so it doesn't make much sense in the 21st century. But uh, the whole philosophy is like, imagine it, it was a video game, like education was a video game. The whole philosophy is like, let's get them all the weapons, all the power-ups, and then we just release them on level one, which that would suck, right? I mean, we know that. Uh, it, it just doesn't work. So that's something that I think we can collaborate with teachers and, uh, and use our expertise and, and with theirs and, and, and help. Of course, uh, a lot of stuff has been uh, done lately. I'm, I'm the world's biggest fan of, of uh, Quest to Learn. I think uh, uh, most of the most interesting things that are, uh, are happening in, in the educational world, I mean, the people from the Institute of Play really know what they're doing. It, that's a beautiful thing. It's not that they know what they're doing. They're really taking risks. And uh, I applaud that. And, but if, if we think uh, about, uh, I'm going to start talking about video games, and then going to talk about play. 
if you think about the educational market and how we adults judge what's to be an educated person, something really weird happens. If you look at the, at the apps and games that are being sold for the educational market, most of them focus on two things, spelling and math. And it's not even math, it's just arithmetic. I mean, like addition, subtraction, that kind of stuff. Why? Because that's what adults are more afraid of. It's not what's more important for kids, but that's what adults are more afraid of. And why? I mean, think about it. Why you're supposed to spell something right and being able to do basic math. Because in the 19th century and 20th century, the Western civilization wanted you to be either a secretary or a clerk. You see bad men, I mean all those women, they had to spell right. Somebody else will take the decisions. So it's, it's not an uh, education system designed for people to think by themselves. There'll be somebody else, probably a guy, who's gonna tell them what to do right. And of course, the world has changed a lot since then and we cannot tolerate this anymore. So, but if you look at the sales, if you wanna, I mean, there's no money in, in this. It's only like a three billion people market. Uh, there's no money in it unless you do either math or spelling and not even math. But actually, I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna first show you a Dragon Box Algebra. Uh, how many of you have played a Dragon Ball Box Algebra? One, two, three. Oh my God, this is five. This is great for the rest of you because I'm not making this up. This is, this is one of the most amazing games I ever seen. Uh, I'm gonna first tell you what it's about. You can actually look in YouTube. This is a, uh, Jean-Baptiste Win. is a, he's not even a game designer, he's a math teacher. Uh, he's French, he lives in Norway. And he created this card game for teaching kids one of the most dreaded subjects ever, which is how to solve algebraic equations. And, uh, and he created a game uh, with that, uh, based on that, on, the, on that card game. And it's so effective. It, it's a lot of fun, but it works so well that you can find on YouTube kids that are five or six year old, old solving algebraic equations that Technically, they're not supposed to until they're 12, 14, 16, or 98. So uh, let me show you the trailer. That's the name of the company, want to know. And it's a perfect tutorial. I mean, uh, it's, it's probably the most elegant tutorial I've ever seen. Every single level, it uh, has a beautiful progression. You start with that box, and you have these other cards, and you have to leave the box on one of the sides. And, uh, and slowly, the little cards begin uh, uh, to, uh, are replaced by numbers and, and, and then by, by letters. And seriously, like, it's spooky the way it works. It really, I mean, kids learn the procedure in such a perfect way that they can move on and, and, and solve the equations almost magically. And, uh, and actually this works so well because it teaches the procedure. A lot of, a lot of people say, well, it doesn't really teach uh, you algebra. I said, well, no, but yes, in the sense that if you, know, if you know how to drive a car and then I explain you how the engine works, well, knowing to drive a car helps you in that, in that understanding. And this is the procedure and our kids are gonna be judged through that procedure. But uh, seriously, it's, it's well, I, I was gonna say it's kind of expensive by uh, app uh, standards, which is, I'm gonna hit myself for saying that. Uh, it's like six bucks, it, it's gonna be the, you, you need a budget of $16 because later I'm gonna show you a 9.99 app. But, uh, and if you don't have an iPad, still one, or move to Uruguay, if you call now, you, you get a free computer, and if you have two kids, you get two computers, and if you call now, we'll throw in a kid just for fun. <laughs> So th this one is available on, uh, uh, on Google, uh, Windows, uh, and it's also available on Linux. But, uh, and they sold uh, a bunch load of, 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 the, uh, of the algebra version. They, they did uh, an also excellent uh, game for uh, geometry called Dragon Box Elements. And according to a Gamma Sutra article, they only sold like 10,000 copies. Why? Because parents are not afraid well, they're afraid of everything, parents, but they're more afraid of algebra than, than, than. 
than the rest of, 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 of math. And um, so lately I've been designing games for over 15 years professionally. And, um, and I really liked this game. I said, well, I mean, there's, I talked to, to, to teachers and said, uh, tell me about what, what's the top five uh, most frustrating topics for school kids. And everybody said the same. Well, I'm going to show you uh, what uh, Twitter says. Long division. If you, if you just, there's a band called Long Division, so don't, don't look for, uh, for Long Division during the weekends, because that's all they talk about. But from Monday to Friday, you have adults and kids and everybody just complaining. And um, I don't even think kids should learn the procedure for long division. I, don't, I, I think it's stupid. It's, it's way more important stuff to learn. But it's so frustrating. And it, this happens between ages 8 or 10, depending where, 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 where you go to school. And uh, it's one of those topics that actually get kids to believe that they're not good for math and they're stupid. It makes them feel stupid. So I was like, okay, well, so I started working on, on a design. It's, uh, I have a working prototype, so if later somebody wants to check it out, I'm just going to show a, an image. Uh, so it, it's sort of like inspired uh, by Dig Dug. And, uh, and you have these characters who are trapped in this, uh, it's an underground city in, a, in some uh, planet. And, uh, and you have to, to move them to these pods, and, and if you can, you have to keep going down. And uh, after a while, the aliens get replaced by numbers, and well, you just learn the procedure. The stupid procedure that kids have so much uh, pain to learn because it doesn't make any sense. It, it's just something that they cannot relate to. So that being said, as I was saying, math is needed. Arithmetic, not that much. But there's a lot of other topics that we can, we can work on. And, and this, is a, this is just a sample. Uh, I mean, uh, the Dragon Box elements, it's, it's what I think really can contribute because kids, kids can do that, that on their own. One of the wet dreams of, of, of the education world is that, uh, uh, well, of, of the edutech world, is to replace uh, teachers with machines. And, and uh, that's not only dangerous, but also stupid and it's never going to work. Um, but before moving to non-digital apps, let me show you the second example, which you will need 9.99 uh, to buy it. It's by uh, Jaime Gingold, who was a finalist here at, at Indicate and launched last week. And it's called Earth A Primer. And uh, I'm not saying this because he's a very good friend of mine, but this is probably one of the most, uh, it's about geology, so I don't want to say groundbreaking, but uh, <laughs> this is a serious contribution to the medium. I mean, this is, you, sh you, should, you have to check it out. <laughs> Has anybody tried it? One, two, three. Wow, this is your lucky day. Yeah, wow. Uh, I mean, what Haim did is a book, an ebook. Not I mean, uh, uh, instead of illustrating it with uh, multimedia, that's so 90s, uh, which is what the book industry believes is going to be the next big thing for some reason, uh, he illustrated the book with simulations. So it's half a book with pages you can read, and sims you can play, you can play with. And Haim is probably one of the most Perfect person to do this. Heim uh, was in charge of uh, uh, designing the Creature Creator from Spore, which is the only decent thing in Spore. Uh, but uh, <laughs> did I say that out loud? In Spanish. No, you didn't understand anything. Uh, and, uh, and he's very, very, very good at crafting uh, uh, little sims. So let me show you a little bit how this works. Let's see the trailer. Start making uh, islands and then you can build volcanoes. Paolo Pedercini described this as a godless god sim, which is a god game, which is super famous. Okay, so. And this is pretty much, this is an, an, uh, an older uh, screenshot, uh, 
But uh, this is pretty much like it looks. I mean, it has a little text on the side, and then the sim you can pl you can play with. Not only I think it's it's amazing in the sense that well, I mean, you can finally have like a magical book that actually good for something. I mean, you can actually learn. But Heim took some very brave decisions here, and uh, and I think. And he's a very accomplished designer. I mean, the problem with, uh, with learning games is that uh, there's a lot of hype about them, but a lot of time for the wrong reasons. Because a lot of people think, oh, kids are bored in school, they're not motivated. What do they like? Candy. OK, we cannot give them candy. What else do they like? Video games. Let's give them video games. And that's a very patronizing, and it's not very useful. And most of educational video games suck. But uh, yeah, that's a little detail that I forgot to mention. <laughs> so why did on earth, pun not intended, but anyway, uh, did he build a book when he could have built like a sim earth kind of game? I mean, he, he has a, he's been working on this for five years by himself. Uh, why a book? And that's something I think is essential if you want to understand uh, learning games, is that we have to unlearn some of the conventions that we learn from traditional game making. Not just from the industry, but from traditional game making. I mean, one of the things about uh, that we kind of take for granted in game making is that games are supposed to be immersive, OK? So what if <laughs> I told you this? And actually, I'm, I'm not the only person tell, saying this. I mean, a lot of other people said it before, mainly Bertu Brecht and then Augusto Boal. I'm going to talk to them uh, about them later. But uh, it's actually, it's not that there is no immersion, but immersion doesn't work the way we think it does. By definition, you cannot critically think about something that you're immersed with, uh, within, by definition. Actually, if you're playing Super Mario level one, two, three, four, five, each time you level up and you go to the two, well, you go to a different level and you face a new enemy, you have to take a step outside from the immersion, critically analyze the game, and say, okay, what, what tools do I have? What are the characteristics of, of this boss? I mean, how do I beat it? That you cannot do while being immersed. So actually immersion, the way it works in games, is actually you're immersed and then there's out immersion and you get out immersed and then it goes back and forth constantly. That's the way it works. We cannot, if we just dive into a game, we cannot connect it to the outside world. And this is something that actually in the 20th century has been extensively, uh, as I was saying, uh, theorized by Bertolt Brecht, who was a playwright, a German playwright, uh, a commie, by the way. Uh, yeah, dangerous. And, um, and he really wanted a revolution. So uh, he basically claimed that Aristotelian traditional drama was not good for learning anything because it basically is a self-contained happy ending, or at least it shows a problem, but then it solves it, for better or for worse, if it's comedy or drama. And, uh, and he said, then the audience cannot really connect what happened on the stage to what happened in their everyday life. And he was basically calling for breaking immersion for learning purposes. And I think what, what Heim did is, again, very brave in the sense that he built a book, I mean, about geology. How unsexy is that? I mean, he could have done something that way more marketable. And this is something that uh, Seymour Puppert uh, always complain about the idea of hiding the education as if it was a shameful thing. This is a video game, so you're gonna play it and you're gonna learn and everything's gonna be all right. Why? Why do we have to hide the fact to kids who are smart, and pretty much smarter, at least smarter than me most of the times, uh, the fact that they are in school and they're supposed to get educated. So the fact that Heim created a book, it's first telling, OK, this is something to learn with. Do we, I mean, imagine if, if, if people turn textbooks into novels in order to make them friendlier to students. That doesn't happen, no? 
because it doesn't make any sense. So why turning this into games? And again, I'm not saying all, all games are, I mean, useful, but the fact, the way we present them, instead of being on a, on a textbook format or, or, or an educational format or something that makes you step away, think about what you're doing, and go back into it. Yes, I'm calling for making education uh, games uh, less fun. Yeah. Guilty as charged. You can, you can tweet about that and you can complain later. But actually, I think that's something that's going to be more useful. If you try this, you may get a better idea of, uh, of where I'm heading to. So I was mentioning uh, Bertolt Brecht, but also he had a, f a follower, a Brazilian playwright called uh, Augusto Boal. Has anybody heard of this book? Cool, okay. Uh, it's, uh, if you Google it, I think there's a PDF version around that. Well, if you just Google it, I mean, it's free. Because information should be free, and, and he was also a commie, so, so he probably wanted to. <laughs> he didn't want the big printed houses to make money out of here. Um, Boal, he was actually one of the most, in my point of view, accomplished uh, game designers of the 20th century. He didn't know that, but he created all these games to deal with critical debate, to get people engaged into discussions through theater, through play, on a stage. And uh, anyway, he has a lot of techniques. And, uh, and this game is a, is a great resource for, uh, for, um, for games that uh, are, n are not connected, I mean, offline games, and uh, dealing with learning and discussing either philosophical or psychological or relational uh, problems. And that's the other point I want to make, and that's something that uh, quest to learn I think, uh, really figured out, is also the fact that we are also taking for granted that if we're going to use play in education and games, we should do it on a digital form. And yes, it's easier to distribute. But I'm a part-time academic, so I got a lot of, lot of conferences. And I've seen dozens of PhDs in computer science trying to hook up a computer to a projector and failing miserably. And we somehow imagine that we can get like 40 school kids to get online at the same time in a multiplayer game and stuff. It most of the time doesn't happen. It's very frustrating. Uh, and there's a lot of, I'm not saying it can be done. I'm, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. But there's, there's other ways to, uh, to deal with this. And, um, and so uh, traditional games in the classroom sometimes uh, can offer stuff that video games cannot. I'm going to show you uh, something that it's, it's work in progress also. Uh, I'm collaborating with a high school teacher. Uh, she teaches history. And we really wanted to teach um, some sort of nonlinear history. I mean, uh, just learning dates and stuff that didn't work very well for the students. So we tried to figure out a different way. And I had a technique that, uh, that sort of invented when dealing with uh, game developers that are young and don't know each other, like in events or game jams. So the technique was they had to write down two columns uh, and pick what three of their superpowers and three of their kryptonites. And then they walk around, and they say stop, and they exchange uh, with whoever's uh, standing next to them. And then they check if, if, if they match, like somebody's kryptonite is somebody's superpower. And then they, oh, you can code. I cannot code, but I can draw. Well, I can make music. And that's the technique I used to, for them uh, to get acquainted. It works very well. So uh, we're adapting that to history. and, and uh, so kryptonite history, and how does this work? Well, kids team up, and they pick a historical figure, let's say, I don't know, J JFK. And they have to, well, make an argument about what would be uh, his uh, superpower or his kryptonite. And then, who was his arch enemy? And what was the arch enemy's kryptonite and superpower? Who was the sidekick? Who was the arch enemy's sidekick? What were? the first superpower, the second superpower, and then they have to debate through that. And this is something that kids know, the structure of superheroes, and basically, we're turning history into Game of Thrones, which, with not so much sex and dragons, but we're working on that. I mean, we can throw that in. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we haven't uh, fully implemented this yet. We, I mean, we tested it, and it seems to work. And it's just an idea. It's, it's not even a game, in the sense that... Uh, 
there's no goal, and and that's uh, that's also something important to think when we're thinking uh, um, about uh, playing in education is, is that the learning happens happens with uh, with the level up, and kind of winning a game, it's sort of the lamest way to level up because that's it, you get stuck. But if you continue progress and you, s you continue exploring new things, so I don't know. I mean, this may we may end up running this first and then creating a card game based on the characters. Uh, we don't care. I mean, we, we just want kids to see that there's different ways to frame uh, historical figures. Some teachers in, in Canada, high school teachers, um, they are, uh, well, we, we adults always complain about all oh, these, these youngsters, youngsters, uh, meddling kids. And, uh, and they were saying, oh, high school students cannot summarize a text anymore. Which is kind of weird because summarizing and, and abstracting stuff is kind of the basic cognitive functions of the human brain. So uh, why would a generation of kids would not be able to? And uh, and these were very smart teachers. What did they do? Instead of asking them to summarize the text, they said, "Well, just type ten tweets about it," and kids did it immediately. Or SMS, just text this uh, to a friend, and because they do that all the time, so it's all a matter of framing, experimenting, taking risks. And that's, again, how I think, I, I, I believe that, uh, that we can contribute. Uh, so there's no clear way of doing this. Uh, there's a billions of dollars being spent on consulting and conferences and stuff on how to change the school system. Uh, I don't know if that's gonna work. What we can do is like, everybody knows a teacher. I mean, teachers are, 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 are nice. They don't have too much money, but uh, they're nice to hang out with. So, uh, and let's say, okay, what's, what's the toughest issue? Uh, well, you may have to hear them whining for like three hours, but after that, so what's the, tough, the toughest thing on your uh, curriculum? And, and let's try to make something interesting and, uh, about it. Collaborate, try to experiment in, in, in the classroom. And that's, that's what I meant by the opposite of boredom. That was the title of, of, of this talk. The opposite of boredom is not fun and it's not entertainment. Entertainment is a self-completed thing. You cannot, I, I'm not saying entertainment is wrong, but you cannot level up. You cannot progress. It's okay to watch something for fun and, or play a game for fun, but the opposite of boredom is actually to be challenged. And so when we, when we see that kids are bored in school and high school and even in university, it's not because they need fun, it's because they need challenges. So, again, books are great. I'm not saying that books and films are not needed, but what games can contribute is based on a little detail. That, I mean, when a book finishes, you have the end, or, or also when a film finishes at the end, you have the end. And games tell you that it's game over, but it also has this little button called try again. Try again and make more mistakes. Try again and learn from your mistakes. Try again and take risks. Try again and play around. I mean, it's a little button that's actually a door full of opportunities. And that's what kids need, and that's, I think, what we can provide if we help teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you.